For the third week in a row, Hendrick Motorsports obliterates the Cup Series competition. This week, it's Kyle Larson getting Rick Hendrick his record-breaking 269th career win. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove Coca-Cola 600 Race Review Edition. There's a lot to talk about tonight. We're gonna talk about the top finishers, we'll talk about Hendrick's dominance, we'll put this race on the groovy gauge at the end of the show, all per usual, but there's a lot to unpack after the greatest day in racing. I know Monaco didn't happen this morning as per usual, but you still had the Indianapolis 500 with over 130,000 fans in attendance, got to see Elio Castroneves win his record tying fourth Indy 500. You went from that spectacle, what I thought was a pretty entertaining IndyCar race Indy 500, to the Coca-Cola 600, a crown jewel for NASCAR, the longest race on the schedule. You had all the Memorial Day tributes before and during the race. This is a super special day for motorsports fans, especially American motorsports fans in this year's case. But because I, and I'm sure many of you, watched both races back to back, it's hard not to make comparisons between IndyCar's biggest event broadcast on NBC, and one of NASCAR's bigger events, broadcast on Fox. Two very different racing series, but two events that were both highly attended. Both grandstands seemed very full. I know IndyCar can usually jam-pack twice that many into the, into the brickyard, but still, the front stretch looked packed, which was gorgeous. And at Charlotte, it looked like most of the 70,000 or so seats were filled over there, so that's really great for NASCAR. Two major motorsports events that left two completely different impacts on me, the viewer. So we're gonna get to the racing in a moment, but I wanna begin this episode by talking about television. You know, I talk a lot about how Fox broadcasts the races or when NBC has the schedule, how NBC and NBCSN cover NASCAR. We talk about that a lot, both on the show, on live stream. Sometimes y'all think I rant about it too much, but to me, TV and how NASCAR is brought to the masses is extremely important for that very reason. You know, 50, 60,000 people may go see the race in person and that's great, but millions every single week watch on TV at home and they are forced to view their favorite motorsport through whatever lens Fox or NBC that week is giving them. You know, they're, you're forced to watch the race through Jeff Gordon, Mike Joy, and Clint Boyer's perspective. You're forced to watch the race through whatever cameras Fox decides to cut to at the time. We don't have a say in it. There's no other venue to go to that I can watch a NASCAR Cup Series race. I have to watch it, if I'm at home, on TV, whether that's Fox or NBC carrying it. So the broadcast and how it's handled, how it goes, how smooth it is, how professional it looks, is extremely important to NASCAR maintaining its current audience and hopefully growing and reaching new audiences. So I talk a lot about TV and I criticize and sometimes nitpick the broadcast quite a bit and that's what I'm gonna do here at the beginning of this episode because what I learned today watching the IndyCar broadcast on NBC and the NASCAR broadcast on Fox back to back is that NASCAR needs to completely overhaul the way it presents its races on TV as soon as possible. If we have to wait until 2025 for a new network perhaps to come in for a new TV contract, so be it. But right now, corporate suits at different networks at NASCAR itself should be brainstorming completely new ideas because the way NASCAR, the way Fox and the way NBC cover NASCAR today in the last 10, 15, 20 years is not going to cut it going forward. I'll break this down to a couple parts. Firstly, perhaps most glaringly, the commercials. You know, NASCAR fans, NASCAR is no stranger to commercializing its product. I mean, they, the cars are basically billboards on track, you know? Advertising is important. I understand that Fox needs to make money on commercials to help pay for the billions they spend on the sport every few years. But the model needs to shift away from full screen commercial breaks five, six times per stage. I counted in stage one today at least five full screen commercial breaks. And I know you're saying, oh, it's just stage one. It's not even, you know, the, the high stakes end of the race. Stage one's when a lot of people are watching. That's the green flag. The most people are watching at the very beginning and the very end. If you're hitting them with a ton of commercial breaks early on, people are going to lose interest. I contrast that with NBC's coverage of IndyCar. There were no full screen commercial breaks during today's Indy 500 during green flag action, during some of the yellow flags they did, but you're not really missing any action there. NBC was able to sell to advertisers side by side coverage, so why can't Fox? Maybe NBC for the NASCAR schedule this year will be able to do the same. I, I, I don't bet on it. But in a world where there are more entertainment options than ever before, many commercial free entertainment options, you go to Netflix, go to Disney Plus, go to Hulu, go to Amazon, if you're paying for it, there's no commercial 
commercials, you go to YouTube, you may get like a five second ad or you pay a couple bucks a month and you get no ads on YouTube. I understand that commercials pay the bills, but at some point they hinder the product so heavily that viewers tune out and the value of selling those commercial spots is gonna go down as well. So that's the first big problem. Secondly, Fox specifically has some issues with content itself. Like during stage one, they had like a, for like eight straight green flag laps, they showed a full screen comedy bit between the booth and Jay Leno. I mean, I don't have any issue with Jay Leno, but he's not the most relevant guy <laughs> today. So that felt like a waste of time. He had a couple funny lines, but it was a waste of time. And we we're missing actual on-track racing to show that, what? But the other big problem I had with today's broadcast, especially when I compare it to the Indy 500 broadcast, and this does fall largely on the booth. You guys know I love Mike Joy, and I think Mike Joy is really good at handling the difficult topics. You know, like last year, after the new steal at Talladega, when he came on the air the next day before the race, I thought the spiel he gave the, to begin the broadcast was extremely impressive. And apparently he made that all up off the cuff. Super duper impressive. He's great at that. Tonight, the Memorial Day tributes, when he was talking, really, really well done. I, he should narrate audiobooks. His delivery is always on point, but the booth in general, the Fox booth in general, completely lacks any intensity, and the coverage in general is so devoid of details that it's it, it hurt multiple times tonight. Early on in this race, Ross Chastain was running like 12th and he came down pit road with an apparent engine issue, went to the garage area, ended up spending 38 laps in the garage, completely taken out of contention. It barely got a mention on the Fox broadcast. And because I watched these two races back to back, I contrasted that with the Indy car race, the Indy 500, like early on, Scott Dixon, Alexander Rossi stalled on pit road and you know, lost a lap. And the broadcasters acted like this was the biggest news in the world. When Graham Rahal, who was not leading the race at the time, wrecked, oh my gosh, heartbreaking, unbelievable. Lee Diffie, Paul Tracy, Townsend Bell, say what you will about them. They gave that moment the, the weight, the levity, the significance that it needed, that it deserved. When Scott Dixon stalled his car on pit road, it was super simple thing, not that exciting to look at, it's just a stalled car on pit road. The commentators gave that moment significance, made that a memorable moment that got me on the edge of my seat wondering what was gonna happen next, how bad is this gonna get for Scott Dixon? It made me feel something. I felt emotions for Scott Dixon, for Alexander Rossi. But during the NASCAR race tonight, I felt absolutely nothing for Ross Chastain because TV barely glanced his direction. And this got even worse later on in the race. Joey Logano pit in stage four. This is like at the final 100 laps. Joey Logano was on the lead lap, not contending for the win, but was on the lead lap, pit with a tire issue. TV did not mention it. Didn't even mention that Logano had a tire issue. Like we saw, they're like, wait, where'd he go? He's not in the top 20 more. They didn't even mention it for 15 laps. And when they finally did, it was Mike Joy just briefly mentioning it as they threw it a commercial. It, 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 I, I'm sorry, but the Indy 500 broadcast did such a good job of making every little move, every little strategy play, every little detail seem like a big deal. A contender, a popular former champion driver, cuts a tire down late in the race and it barely gets a mention? I'm sorry, but the broadcast booth can add so much to the viewing experience and for whatever reason, the last few years especially, Fox and NBC, I, I know we haven't gotten to Rick Allen and Dale Jr., their portion of the schedule, but they're guilty of a lot of this too. NASCAR broadcasters consistently do not give these moments the attention or the weight or the emotional response they deserve. When Graham Rahal got out of that car in the Indy 500, I mean, yes, Graham Rahal, the visuals were powerful as well with him down on his you know, head, head in his hands, he was upset, but the commentary, the TV coverage did a great job of letting that breathe and letting the audience really feel that moment. There was not a single moment tonight, there were several. Martin Truex Jr. cut a tire down late as well and it also barely got a mention. You know, there were several moments where contenders, big name drivers, ran into trouble tonight and they barely got, you know, they might've even gotten a chuckle. Like, you know, the, the NASCAR booth, chuckles when things happens. Whereas IndyCar, Formula One, it's serious. Oh my goodness, this guy cut a tire. He stalled on pit road. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I mean, maybe if I watched more IndyCar F1 broadcasts, it would get a little old. I'd be like, okay, yeah, the guy just stalled on pit road. Maybe not, but still, at least for a casual viewer like myself, I appreciate when the broadcast booth adds to the experience in that way. I don't want to say that Mike Joy, Jeff Gordon, and Clint Boyer like took away from the broadcast. They just didn't add anything to it. And that's a problem to me. I feel like if you have that position, if you have that ability to influence the show, if you don't take advantage of it, that's that's as big a crime as if you're taking away from it. So that, that was something that stood out to me watching this NASCAR broadcast after an IndyCar broadcast back to back, especially a big one that was highly produced like the Indy 500. It just showed me all the glaring holes that Fox and NBC in some ways have in their NASCAR coverage. And it just made me realize, it gave me kind of an epiphany that I don't want to see anything like what we've seen this year 
when NASCAR gets its new TV contract in 2025. Throw everything you thought you knew about covering a NASCAR race on television and start fresh. See what ideas you come up with. We've seen them tinker with things in the past, different camera angles. NBC's tried that radio style broadcast at some tracks. They've experimented a little bit, but throw everything you thought you knew out. I wanna see something completely different in three years when the new TV contracts become reality. Today's race was not terrible. I'll put this thing on the groovy gauge in a moment, but the TV broadcast, especially in the first half, I thought for sure took so much away from my enjoyment of the race. It was bad. Back to back, it did not hold a candle to what NBC did with the Indianapolis 500 today. So I don't know, that stood out to me and I'm sure it stood out to many of you as well. I hope I did an okay job articulating it, but I don't know. I just wish NASCAR would bring race view back. It's, it's painful because the technology is clearly still there. They cut to it sometimes on TV using those 3D models. They have the technology, sell it to me. I will pay for race view as I did for many, many years. And hopefully many others did too. I guess not enough did. I guess a lot of people unsubscribed over the years and they deemed it unsuccessful. But my goodness, I wish they'd bring that back. Please NASCAR, bring that back. That would enhance the viewing experience tenfold. Anyway, there's probably a whole lot more I could say about it. Maybe I'll put my thoughts into a more co cohesive video here very, very soon, but I record these things immediately after I turn my TV off, immediately after the race. This is very spur of the moment, and we do have a whole lot more to get to here tonight. So without further ado, let's talk about the winning team, the winner of tonight's race. Kyle Larson gets his second win of the season. He backs up three straight second place finishes the last three weeks with a win. His average finish the last four weeks is 1.75. That's crazy, but he finally got the deal done. He finally won his first first cup race more of more than 400 miles in length. So there you go. The sprint car racer finally won a marathon. <laughs> he swept the stages as well. As a matter of fact, max, max points day for Kyle Larson in the Coke 600. Hendrick Motorsports gets all four of their drivers in the top five, almost for the second time in three weeks, swept the top four finishing positions. Chase Elliott ends up a close, not really a close, he was 10 seconds back, but you know, he comes up second. He was competitive at times tonight. Kyle Busch, the lone non-Hendrick driver, breaking up that top five Brigade. William Byron, Alex Bowman round out the top five. Hendrick Motorsports surpasses Petty Enterprises record. They become the most winningest team in NASCAR Cup Series history. This was their 269th victory. I don't need to go back to TV for a moment, but this is another thing. Just now hit me off the top of my head, but Fox barely mentioned this until like the final 40 or 50 laps. They didn't even mention earlier. You could have mentioned early on, hey, Crown Jewel event and NASCAR, one of their most storied teams is trying to seek history. They could have made that a big, big deal. It really didn't get mentioned until like the last 40 laps of the broadcast. Huge whiff there. Compare that to IndyCar, where early on, Connor Daly takes the lead and the crowd goes wild. Like, Connor Daly, he's grew up 10 minutes from the track. He's an Indianapolis boy. What a story it would be. Oh, hey, hey Leo Castroneves is trying to become only the fourth driver to win four Indy 500s. You know, they were hyping those storylines up throughout the event. Kept me into interested, kept me engaged. Fox dropped the ball with this one as well. The Hendrick Motorsports trying to beat Petty's record should have been a story from the drop of the green flag, but it was hardly mentioned until the closing laps when Larson had a 10 second lead and quite frankly, Boyer, Gordon, and Joy probably ran out of other things to talk about. That's not good TV. Anyway, Kyle Larson gets the win, yes, in dominating fashion. I mean, he really didn't dominate this race until that final stage, even though he won the first three stages. You know, Byron got out front for a while and led. Chase Elliott ran him down and passed him at one or two different points. You know, it was a pretty competitive race between those three Hendrick drivers. Bowman lagged a little bit further behind. Occasionally a JGR car would sneak into the top five or top three, but really it was Byron, Larson, and Elliott from green flag to checkered flag. Kyle Larson gets the win. Pretty cool moment. Man, I couldn't help but think towards the end of this race about if Kyle Larson had begun his NASCAR career driving for someone like Hendrick. You know, he spent his first, what, six years roughly with Chip Ganassi. Not a bad team, but certainly not a powerhouse organization. He'd still won a few races for them, but man, Kyle Larson's what, like 28 years old? I, I can only imagine the kind of pace he might be on as far as career wins, maybe have a championship by now if he'd been with a Hendrick or someone since the very beginning. But he's there now and he's dominating. He has been the fastest car consistently, the fastest driver all season long, especially at the mile and a half. He was an easy pick. I, I picked him coming into the weekend. It was an easy pick. Started on pole, dominated, led over 300 laps, I believe, won the race by 10 seconds. I mean, it was not thrilling down the stretch, but still Kyle Larson, he has been the best driver. That five team has been the best team consistently this year. Watch out. Boyer asked early or late in the broadcast, maybe they're peaking too early. He might have a point, but hey, it's better to peak early than never. And right now, Hendrick Motorsports, Kyle Larson especially, are on top of the NASCAR world. Let's talk about some of these other top finishers. I don't mean to brush over the other Hendrick guys, but 
I know we have a lot to get to tonight. Chase Elliott, another solid second, backs up his win at Coda last weekend with a strong performance on an oval. That's important. Kyle Busch carrying the banner for Toyota. Elliott, Busch, and Byron were all over each other that entire final stage. They, we saw Kyle Busch and Byron talking to each other on pit road after the race. Nothing super intense, but I thought that was interesting. They were racing really, really hard. Very strong performance once again for the two Richard Childress racing cars. Austin Dillon ends up finishing sixth. Tyler Reddick not too far behind. The RCR cars, it's almost expected at this point for them to run inside the top 10. Both of those drivers, I believe, still are inside the top 16 in points, looking at both making the playoffs. That would be a huge accomplishment. And speaking of you know smaller teams kind of experiencing a small resurgence here, Roush Fenway Racing. I know Newman blew a tire, but he was running around 12th at the time. Chris Buescher gets another solid top 10. He was another guy I talked about as a good underdog pick coming into this weekend because they'd been fast at mile and a half. Took them a while to get up to speed, but once again, they get a very solid finish. Great run for him. Also, Ricky Stenhouse started second, stayed in the top 15 most of the race, ends up uh, 12th. Uh, Kevin Harvick gets the final spot in the top 10. You'll notice there are no other SHR cars here. It's just the same song and dance every single week. SHR, at least they didn't wreck any cars this weekend. I guess if there's any small silver lining that they can take, at least they didn't junk any equipment for like the first time in a month. So yeah, SHR is still way off the pace. Harvick is doing everything he can to keep them relevant. Bubba Wallace, Daniel Suarez, who battled back from an early uh, tire issue, I believe it was. He was a, a lap down early on. I forget exactly why, sorry, but came back strong late to finish inside the top 15. Good for the two new teams. Bad day for for Chip Ganassi Racing, their drivers finish last and second to last. Early on, Ross Chastain had an engine issue, like as I mentioned earlier, that Fox barely talked about. Had a belt issue, I believe, inside the motor. A few laps later, or not long later, Kurt Busch had the same issue, apparently. Both teams spent time in the garage area. Kurt Busch came back out and blew up for good. Chastain came back out and actually was able to you know, finish most of the laps, but both of them finished 37th and 38th. Terrible day for Ganassi, gosh. Truex's tire issue cost him a solid top 15 run. He ends up 29th. Other JGR issues, Christopher Bell got into the wall in this race. He ends up 24th. Logano ends up 17th as a result of his tire issue, but there you have it. Those are your top finishers from Charlotte. Finally, let's talk about the racing. 550 horsepower rules package, the PJ1, eh, neither were terrible, neither were great tonight. I, I don't really think Charlotte's the type of track that needs PJ1, but yeah, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong there. The 550 package had its normal issues. Guys would often drive in really deep and then wash up behind somebody in dirty air. Typical 550 horsepower package issues, but you could pass several passes for the lead despite Hendrick's dominance. So I thought that was decent. Not a bad race by any means, but it was a long race. Not as long as past Coke 600s. In fact, I believe the official time of this race came in just under four hours. That's actually one of the fastest, if not the fastest, Coke 600s in history. The Coca-Cola 600, it's a special race because it's one, it's at Charlotte Motor Speedway. That's basically NASCAR's hometown, but two, because it's 600 miles long. It's the longest race on the schedule. It's hundred miles longer than the next longest race. And that for years has been its unique characteristic. Early days of NASCAR, of the World 600, you know, it was a battle of attrition. Could these machines withstand that extra hundred miles of punishment? You know, could drivers, could their fitness be put to the test? Could drivers stay focused for 600 miles? You know, it, it became a challenge. It was a huge challenge in its early years. That challenge has slowly dwindled away over the years to where now, I think, when you ask drivers about the Coke 600 compared to like, say, you know, 500 miles at Texas, I mean, the drivers don't really have anything different to say about it. It's like, oh yeah, it's an extra 100 miles. Might drink, you know, an extra bottle of water beforehand. Yeah. Just kind of is what it is. <laughs> the strain put on these cars isn't enough to cause massive equipment failures. The drivers are in good enough shape these days that you're not seeing guys, you know, just rubber arm pass out at the wheel. It, it's not as grueling of conditions as it once was. And tonight, especially, the temperature was pretty cool most of the day. It was a cakewalk by Coke 600 standards. So it does beg the question, as we ask kind of every year, does NASCAR need a 600 mile race? I like keeping the Crown Jewel races, their traditional distances, like the Daytona 500. I like that at 500. And even the Coke 600. Even though it's not gonna be the most exciting, thrilling edge of your seat action throughout, I kind of like that it's unique in that respect and that it does have that extra 100 miles tacked on to the end. It is a slightly different challenge that I, I do appreciate and enjoy. Widely speaking, I do think NASCAR could do with less 500 mile races. I think most races should be under 400 miles in length, but I'm okay with the Coke 600 being that little special one. I'll be curious to see what you guys think down in the comments, but now let's put this race on the groovy gauge. I've talked about it a little bit so far, 
wasn't great. I mean, any race that's won by over 10 seconds clearly wasn't a nail biter, so it didn't have that going for it. It wasn't a bad race. I think the early portion of the race, especially for me, was clouded by the just egregious Fox broadcast. I say egregious, it wasn't really any worse than any other Fox broadcast. It just back to back compared to the Indy 500, which was, you know, nonstop or almost commercial free throughout. It was kind of painful to then sit through the lengthy full screen commercial breaks, the often uninteresting and uneducating banter, the Jay Leno cameo. <laughs> I, I, I didn't need a lot of that stuff. So I think the first portion of this race was a bit jaded because of that, because the lens I was watching the race through because I had no other choice. I didn't have race view. I didn't have anything else. I had to watch through Fox. The lens just was dirty. I did not like it. It was not a clear picture to me. But if I try to look past a lot of that stuff, the racing, the actual action on track was decent, was decent tonight. Yes, Kyle Larson ran off with it, but we had great battles for, especially for second between the two other Hendrick cars and Kyle Busch. Lap traffic was, <laughs> they, 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 they kept things interesting. They shook things up tonight, especially the 52 of Balicki, the 66 of David Starr. They got several mentions by the broadcast booth tonight because they were, in harm's way more often than they weren't, it seemed. So you definitely had some mm, pucker moments. Only a couple of cautions for incident. I mean, again, these cars are pretty darn stable. So unless they run into each other and crash each other, you're not gonna see many guys just get loose and spin out. A couple guys did, like Christopher Bell got into the wall that one time. A late in this race, some guys like Reddick, I remember sliding around, Byron was sliding around. That's probably why Kyle Busch was talking to him after the race. But you know, cars were not quite as edge of control as they've typically been at Charlotte Motor Speedway. So. It was an okay race. I can't say much more about it. I'm trying not to let the broadcast and my frustrations with it alter my score too heavily. I'm going to give the Coca-Cola 600 a 55% on the groovy gauge. It was a, a very average race, maybe slightly above average, at least when it comes to the racing on track. I would say the overall viewing experience tonight was probably in the high 40s, uh, honestly. But as far as the racing, the action on track, which is what I really try to focus most of this groovy gauge on, it was pretty decent. It was fine. It was okay. Not amazing. It was a blowout by all means, but there were still some good moments throughout. And I will say it was a four hour race that honestly didn't really feel like four hours. It felt like a 500 mile race. It felt like it was about a three, three and a half hour typical NASCAR race. So I didn't, I didn't find this race dragging too much. So I, I think that deserves some credit. Anyway, 55% for me. What would you guys give this race on your groovy gauges? That's all I've got. I feel like I have so much more to say, but I try to keep these episodes pretty concise. Uh, you guys are probably rolling your eyes right now. We'll talk more about this race, I'm sure, later this week, but that's all I've got for now. Those are my initial reactions. Thank you all for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you're new to the channel. We talk NASCAR every single day, whether it's race reviews, talking about news, rumors, predictions, anything of the sort. Thank you, as always, to my amazing Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this show without your tremendous support. I appreciate you guys checking this video out. I will see you all again very, very soon. Have a fantastic Memorial Day weekend. I'll see you in the next video.